it's actually both an advantage and a disadvantage to be the last speaker of the day. An advantage because, uh, you know, I have, uh, I can embellish and develop on many of the wonderful themes that have been discussed. And a disadvantage because a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about had already been talked about. So I deleted many of my slides. Um, I'm really going to be talking about cities in the majority world. And majority world is a term that's typically now used, uh, replacing what used to be called the developing countries, because those countries really form the majority world. Um, I'm going, I live in Delhi, so I'm going to bring a lot of the experiences of uh, living in a mega city in the developing world, as well as the work that I do around the world and uh, some of the experiences that I've had um, working with many organizations. Um, it has been talked about in the morning. Where is this urban turn in 2008, where majority of the urban population are living? But really, uh, most of the urban population of the future are going to be living in Africa and Asia, and much more in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, two of the poorest regions of the world, which are right now not very much urbanized, but they are really going to be urbanizing uh, fast and contributing to urban populations. And just three countries, India, China, and Nigeria, are going to contribute the most number of urban dwellers by 2050. India is pretty much going to double its urban population by 2050. And where is this urban growth really happening? Urban is a very tricky term. Pretty much every country defines it differently. India today is considered to be 32% urban. But really, if we take a definition from another country, we would probably be more than 50% urban. The reason for that is we still consider uh, urban to be um, you know, a population where more than 70% of the population are male population engaged in non-agricultural activities. There's also a density. There is an area definition, etc. Now, between our two censuses, 2001 and 2011, we have pretty much doubled the number of cities and towns. Most of these growth, the urban growth has happened in what we call census towns. These are towns without any self-governance structures. They don't have local municipal corporations or municipalities. In a way, they do not know. So basic services is a problem. Governance is a problem. This is where the maximum urban growth has happened because villages have got notified as towns. India also has a lot of million plus cities. Actually, 33% of the growth between the censuses had been in the million plus cities where 43% of the urban population live. And, uh, Big cities in India have big challenges like anywhere else. It has been reflected upon in the morning, the challenge of air pollution in these cities. This is an example from Jakarta, where um, there is this big grand design. The call for you know, air pollution fighting is going on. UNICEF is a partner in this. I'm not going to be talking any theory in this presentation. It has all been taken care of. We all know the effects on children for bad air. Now, some of the solutions, some of the policy challenges are that many ideas are being tried out uh, in whether it's a Jakarta or the next slide, which is New Delhi. And there are commonalities in these policy initiatives. One of the lowest hanging fruits for uh, decision makers is to, in these kind of cities, is to do something called the odd even days. Uh, my city from 4th of November till about the 14th of November is going to bring back the odd even days, where odd and even number cars will apply on alternate days of the week when it's anticipated the air quality is going to go down. Delhi actually has got pretty bad in the last few years. Uh, things had to go really bad for policymakers to really take attention. We run a campaign in India called the Outdoor Classroom Day, which is about getting school children to go out and play. And typically, th there is a global day. It's in November. Last year, on Outdoor Classroom Day, which was, I think, 4th of November or something, it was a red alert day. Schools were off for a week because of the air quality. Ever since, a lot of decisions has been taken, uh, which has shown improvements. This year, apparently, Delhi has 
much more good air quality days than in the last four years. And some of these are actually quite interesting, and this is where the cultural relevance comes in. Um, there is a point there which talks about community Diwali laser show. Now, Diwali is like the Christmas of India. It's the biggest festival in North India, where we have fireworks, we light lamps, and there are crackers that are burst all over the city. You can't sleep the whole night because of the noise and the air pollution. And there has been the challenge going on. Schools had been talking about it. No firecrackers, no firecrackers. But even then, in the middle of the night, you know, the firecrackers are out in full swing. So this year, the government has taken this initiative to have, instead of, it's all about light. Diwali is the festival of light, going from darkness to light. So these community laser shows are about having these laser shows at the community level to give you the light without the pollution. So it's interesting to see how cities are tackling these challenges, and a lot of this, and messages are going through schools to promote these at the community level. And there is, of course, a national program because about, uh, for about more than 102 polluted cities uh, to tackle this challenge in the long term over a five-year plan. The next challenge, uh, and both, uh, I'm just really going to be talking about three major environmental issues here, which is air pollution. The second one is challenge, and these are traffic, uh, also incorporated within the sustainable development goals. Um, Road crashes, as we know, and traffic uh, in general is a nightmare in a lot of these majority world cities. Uh, as pointed out earlier, that more than 40% of these are actually non-motorized traffic on the streets who vie for space, the same street space. A lot of guidance that's been given out by recently, street guidelines, etc., by many, many organizations, which are great, but there is also this component of behavior change, unsafe behaviors. Um, the fact that, you know, traffic crashes are cr killing much more, many more numbers of young people than HIV AIDS, AIDS today across the world. Um, and most of these are pedestrians or people on motorcycles and cycles. And yet today, India has recently brought in very stringent guidelines and traffic fines for violations such as this, not wearing helmets, not wearing seat belts, etc. But the pushback, the political pushback had been unbelievable. We have 28 states. Many of those states came under so much pressure from citizens. In the first day the law came in, there was a massive take of fines. You know, the, it was like, it's, it was seen as a way to also fill the coffers of the city. Many states said, push, pushed back and said, no, we are not going, we are going to halve the fine or we are not going to impose the fine. It's punitive. Um, so it's, it's a big discussion right now in India. How do we create safer streets through policy? And it's interesting to see how this all pans out. What's interesting, a lot of the solutions to take back streets are happening at the community level by civil society. This whole thing, the Ragiri days, which are taking over city streets, uh, these are mostly Ragiri days. Any, any community-based organization can say, we want to do it. My own neighborhood does it a few times of the year. But they have to take permission from law enforcement. They have to get permission from the uh, city municipal corporation. Uh, we have four in Delhi. Um, and Basically, major streets are taken over on a Sunday and it becomes like a pedestrian, free-for-all, uh, play, music, sports, anything that you want, kind of a space. Um, there is also a very uh, nice uh, uh, way of looking at street design in India, which is very contextually relevant, streets and socialization spaces, which is what streets were in our traditional cities. This is an example from Pune. This was done by ITDP and, uh, and the Municipal Corporation of Pune. And um, this is a very, very good development because this push back to cut down on the right of way of vehicles and to claim increase the pedestrian stretch um, uh, and the sidewalks, both as a socialization space as well as a play space, is something that started happening as pilots. Now, how they are going to scale up, this requires a lot of political buy-in. There are lots of discussions happening, but it's interesting, again, to see how these uh, good pilot, pilot scales up and becomes policy initiative. Um, 
interesting to note, we have, uh, <laughs> India has so many cities, but the whole gray zone on the top, that's the Indo-Gangetic Plain. Most of our cities, definitely the million plus cities, are concentrated in that zone. And they only occupy 1% of India's land. So it goes without saying that our cities are extremely high density. And when you have that kind of high density uh, cities, there is uh, bound to be a lot of crisis. Um, the most important one being that is housing. There is a dearth of adequate shelter in most of our cities. There was a child equity analysis done looking at urban and rural data, and for the bottom most wealth quintiles, it was found that urban children were far more deprived on three categories, shelter, nutrition, and education. Why education? Cities host a lot of migrant populations who do not have the requisite documents to be able to be admitted to schools. This is a huge hidden problem. Shelter, in the last census estimate, 18.78 million units is the deficit, but it's actually it's much more because that's what is recorded. Um, and there is also this push from, to go from the unplanned to the planned, the push for planning. This is Mumbai. Um, more than 70% of Mumbai or Delhi live in informal settlements. We talk about the planned city, there's so much of wealth generated in these cities, but the planned city is actually a very, very small part of the city. Most of it is unplanned. So in this push for planning, one thing one has to understand that it actually also presents a paradox. Because you have the planned city, the unplanned city, however, despite this push for planning is also increasing in many ways, and the, there is deepening of inequality between the two. How do we address these mega challenges? And in a way, when you look at childhoods that are housed in the unplanned city versus the childhoods that's housed in the planned city, they're also very, very different. Because in the planned city, and typically in high-rise buildings, a lot of the problems that we discussed in this room today are true. In the unplanned city, children can be seen in the public space all the time. And as a friend of mine who came from uh, the US working on a project with me, said, these children actually seem to be pretty healthy. They are not obese, they are fit, they're playing all the time. That may be the case, but then they are deprived on so many different other indicators which rob them of opportunities of future upward mobility. Now, because housing is such a shortage, there is this, uh, and, and this push for the uh, planned city, a major effort of ma these cities are slum redevelopment or resettlement. In Mumbai, in the M East Ward, it's a city ward which houses about 800,000 people. It's also the poorest ward of the city, which houses a lot of the uh, slums and resettlement colonies. Um, so the, if you look at the Human Development Index of Mumbai, which is 0.56, and in M East Ward is 0.05. So that's the kind of inequality and deprivation that we are talking about between the planned and the unplanned. And the slum population of that ward is 77.5% as compared to the rest of the city, which is 54%. And See, and on pretty much every indicator, average age at death, infant mortality, it's like way off the charts. Um, now, with these kind of developments, with the slums becoming these flatted housing, now this is a, a resettlement housing in Emmys Ward, Lalubai compound, where uh, we had a project with UNICEF. Um, we did a ma mapping on um, this was a project on safe communities that we were doing in three cities. So people who live here were evicted from all parts of Mumbai due to road widening, lots of infrastructure projects, road widening, you know, mostly transport related. And this was a World Bank initiative. There were lots of guidelines set for the resettlement. When you look at this complex in an architectural drawing, it looks beautiful because you have so much open spaces, they're all nicely colored in green. 
But this is the reality. And now the, Mumbai is going to come up with a new development plan. These are eight-storied buildings. Now, in the new development plan, the FAR is going to go up which means these buildings in future will become 20 storied towers. And so even today, people cannot come down, and there were 24 blocks in this particular compound. Only eight had working lifts in them. So there is a, people above the fourth floor don't come down, particularly the elderly. So there's a parallel economy. Children actually carry food, water, laundry, no one, and there is garbage collection happening at the ground level. People are not going to come down with their garbage. So they just throw it down. So one has to really understand what is, you know, if an environment looks like this, why does it look like this? Because it's not an enabling environment. It does not support basic functions of life. And is this the future of the planned city for the urban poor? What is the prospect of children? in these kind of places. So we did a risk mapping in this environment. And we asked about safe and unsafe spaces to children. Interestingly, the first safe space the children talked about is the police station, which is in the heart of the community. Because crime rates are very high. A lot of those banks of flats were not occupied. There's these dark slabs on the top. And you know, pretty much anything can happen there. They talked about the center run by an NGO, they talked about schools, and they talked about familiar spaces. And pretty much the, all the, the roads, the cement medan is basically a very big open space, um, and the public toilets, um, alcohol shops, etc. Now, when we did the mapping, and this was all in GIS, 68% of this is actually open space in the compound. Um, and we worked with children in various ages from six years to 18 years, on an average, 41% um, of the total open space was considered to be unsafe. About 20% of that open space was considered to be safe by children. Now, this again flies in the face of this SDG 11.7 goal of creating safe, green public spaces for children. And children's perceptions and parents, we also talked to parents, and there was this whole idea of crime hotspots by mothers and fathers. There's a, some commonalities there. Um, but these are really the top concern for parents here too was traffic accidents, road accidents. Then public sexual harassment of girls and women in public spaces, alcoholism, gambling, drug abuse. Because these open spaces are not usable, children have nowhere to go. They are in the higher stories restricted to those dark corridors inside there is immense rise in substance abuse in this community. We actually found amongst this uh, group that we worked with about interviewed uh, 500 children, 500 families, um, there was actually about 80% of the kids in these families were addicted to some form of substance or the other. And sometimes initiation was happening at the age of five. And this speaks to this huge public health problem of nothing to do, nowhere to go. And there is no dearth of open spaces or public spaces, which brings us to this question about the quality of public spaces. And I'm going to talk about this project, this uh, flagship um, mission of India, which was doing the slum replacement uh, housing, two categories. Uh, we did this evaluation across six cities. This was an award-winning project which did this replacement redevelopment housing. Very humane with these kind of, you know, lots of open spaces. But still, the bottom two pictures are not in that community. The top two pictures have no trees in them. So this was an open space that these kids go to and they call it paradise. And how do they reach paradise? From their housing down there, up there, crossing these heavy traffic streets to go there just to have contact with nature. Similarly, the other model, which was in situ slum redevelopment through intense participatory process, which was the best practice in Pune we found, which reclaimed a lot of these everyday spaces for play. And so that was, it was very corrective surgery, Patrick Geddes-like approach, and it widened the streets, made sure that, you know, all the services work well and every, so all the services were put underground, etc. Here too, no one thinks beyond the immediate neighborhood. Children's 
mobility and children's range in these kind of communities are not restricted to their neighborhoods alone. They will seek out those other spaces. Uh, the everyday freedoms that Tim talked about is uh, of a much larger range for slum children. There are some examples, some NGOs trying to infuse life in a lot of these dull, lifeless spaces. This is an example from Mumbai. This is uh, our own example of trying to bring in pop-up play in uh, areas where total play deprivation, no kind of, um, any kind of opportunities for children to play. And so this had been, again, at a pilot stage. Coming back to my own city, and I'll just finish with this, Delhi has 20% open spaces. Uh, it has thousands of parks managed by different organizations. Off late, there, is, uh, there had been a push from the, our child rights watchdog, the National Commission for the uh, Child Rights, uh, had talked about creating more child-friendly parks. So the city is now making an effort to do this. There had been delegations to London and Copenhagen to look at play spaces. Um, this is a new playground that has been created. Uh, previously, there are lots of parks, but no playgrounds. There was only one big playground before. So this is a new playground, and it uh, looks nice, but it's on a fair weather day, Sunday morning, absolutely empty. And the reason for that, in February, when I visited with, as part of a delegation with the city corporation, with the donor, it was all fine. We were told it's open to children throughout the day. Any child can come any time. Three weeks ago, I visit, oh. it's ticketed. And so, there's, for a family to go there, you have to pay 100 rupees, which a poor family and children every day, even a middle class family is not gonna pay that for an outing. And all this prohibitive signage, there's lots, but I just picked up three. Children without proper footwear not allowed. Barefoot children not allowed, which means read slum children not allowed. Children are not to cause any annoyance or disturbance to other users. This is a children's playground. <laughs> Children who are unwell will not be permitted to play in the play area. And then there's others. Children should only use the play equipment in the manner it has been designed for. So all these things. So that really brings us to this question of translatability of what's happening in the West when those ideas come, it's easy to copy the physical environment. How do you change the social environment? How do you change mindset? And also, cultural norms of the governance systems themselves. Next year, we are hosting this uh, big play conference in India, in Jaipur. Um, the topic is play and resilience for the International Play Association. And um, it's wonderful the kind of conferences we had around this room since morning. Uh, you're all welcome to come to India next year. Thank you. Thank you. Roger and Tim, stay. Okay.